Good evening. I'm Lee Harvey, and I'm honored to be the Vice President of Development at American Farmland Trust. And as John shared earlier, we are just so delighted to be in partnership with um, Common Table Creative and, and Oliver and Simon. Um, it's an important partnership that's helping us move forward and spread the message uh, about the role of food in sustainability and in the well-being of our nation and world. The, the main message that we're trying to get through with this film is that the food and our food system is deeply interconnected to our personal health, to environmental health, and to the health of our society. And through our individual food choices, we all have a tremendously powerful role to play in the stewardship of our planet, in our own health, and in moving our country in a, in a better direction. And I think once we realize that our food choices are powerful, we realize that all of our consumption choices are powerful. And we can source things in a way that destroy and degra de degrade, degrade, <laughs> and degenerate the earth. Thank you. Or we can source things in a way that restore, replenish, and regenerate the earth. And food is a powerful vehicle for us to have that realization. And for us to take part in that process every day. And it can be very, very positive. So that is one of the, the things we re really want to get through with this film. The film and storytelling just has such a unique ability to change people's perspectives within an hour and 30 minutes. You can come out of a theater a completely different person than you went in. Um, I had a very uh, specific experience when I was younger and I saw the film An Inconvenient Truth and that cracked open my world. You know, I guess I was maybe, I was young, I was very young and it was the first ever experience of realizing that the grown-ups weren't taking care of the world in the way that I thought they were. Um, and that film set me on a course of wanting to know more about climate change, our effect on the planet, and what we can do about it. Um, and, you know, that film and a lot of films like it leave you feeling um, a little defeated. It feels like there's not a lot of hope. Um, and it's from the beginning, Oliver and I set out to make a film about the positive stories of people like Mark, like Lisa, like the BD, that are every day doing the hard work to push the rock up the hill to actually try to make a better planet for us to live on. Um, and I just wanted to hopefully inspire the audience when they saw it and come away with a little bit of hope and realize that there is a way out. Um, and yeah, I think uh, cinema um, has a very unique ability to change the minds of the viewer. And from the beginning, that was the goal. I hope it worked. <laughs> I think it might have. <laughs> um, John, there was a line in the film that really stuck with me. Um, and, and, in, and paraphrasing it, it was the eating food. It's talking about eating food that is participating in the stewardship of the planet. And when you think about uh, the role and the programs of American Farmland Trust, can you talk about the, the alignment of our work with uh, the themes and the, um, the goals of this film? Well, as you know, Lee, American Farmland Trust mission is quite broad. It's, it's holistic, and it's really about thinking about the land itself, um, the, the practices that occur on that land, and the people who steward that land, both current farmers and the future farmers who we need to recruit and engage. So it's fairly broad. And I think Oliver and Simon did a fantastic job of, of integrating many pieces of, of those, we call them sometimes the pillars of our mission, the three pillars of our mission, into what they did. A lot of the focus was really on the practices side, which which makes sense. That's that's natural, um, and you heard you heard Mark talk about restorative uh, agriculture. Um, you heard several people talk about regenerative agriculture. You'll hear the term climate smart agriculture. Uh, that they, they all basically are about various techniques that look holistically at the needs, and at their core, they're about building soil health and and that has so many benefits um, uh, improving the quality of the food that's grown in it obviously um, making sure at the same time that that soil can be more resistant to major um, 
rain events and things like that. It becomes a, a resistance to, to, to some of the climate impacts that we're seeing. But then the other wonderful thing about all of this is it's simple chemistry. When you're increasing soil health, you're building its organic matter. And that means you're increasing the carbon in the soil. And that carbon's coming from the atmosphere. So probably about one third of all the carbon that's in our atmosphere right now, which is causing the climate crisis, has been released from our soil. It's not the full answer, but it's a big part of the answer. So if we're, th if we're thinking about being better land stewards, which is at, at the heart of, I think, what Oliver and Simon were so wonderfully portraying. And in American Farmland Trust, we've been working on soil health for 40 years. Um, I would say I wasn't around at the time working at AFT, but in 1985, when we, we got the conservation title of the Farm Bill passed, people weren't thinking about climate change. They were just thinking about preventing erosion, uh, building better soil. But the beauty is, because nature is this incredible machine, the beauty is that doing good does good in multiple ways simultaneously. Um, and so if you look at the programs of American Farmland Trust, and we have several dozen of them, took our individual projects at this point in time, we have probably you know, 350 or 400 of them. Um, they are working directly to help farmers be better stewards. Next year, we will work directly with 30,000 farmers and ranchers. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing. And it's a, it's a hell of a lot more than even a few years ago. And that's a sign, you know, there, there was a lot of hope in, in the film that Simon and, and Oliver produced. There's a lot of films about agriculture which only tell the, 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 sad, the part. sad part. Right, exactly. And uh, I applaud you folks for, for being positive. There's a reason for hope. And, and we, we can be very skeptical of a lot of things, including our political process. But the fact that AFT is supporting 30,000 farmers next year to help them build soil health and follow better practices is a direct result of federal agricultural policy. There have been major changes to the positive in the last few years. Um, it's great to see. It's great to see. Um, more money than ever before, but more important than the money has been the change of mindset. The passage of the, the Inflation Reduction Act is also the first time ever that Congress ever pointed out that agriculture done right can be a climate solution. That is a sea change. And, and why did that happen? It happened because the public is increasingly demanding that the right thing happens. So everyone in this room has a critical, critical role to play. Policymakers follow the lead of what they're hearing from their constituents. You may not believe that. You may not think they don't listen. But if enough people are saying the right thing, they, they do. And I speak from experience. I have a dark, dark past. Um, I, I served in the Maine state, I'm from Maine, uh, but as far from here as you can be and still be in the, in the United States. And I served in the state legislature for many years, chaired the agriculture committee and, and served as House Majority Leader. And when you get calls from eight, 10, 20 constituents, you listen. And that has been the difference of the, I've been in this space for 35 years. The difference in the last five years compared to the previous 30 is that people are recognizing that their actions make a difference. And as, as Mark said, and if you haven't read his book, he's got a great book on restorative agriculture. As Mark said in the film, it really begins with you making changes in your own life. That's number one. But it's also critically important for you to speak up. Um, so after that wake up moment, that was kind of my aha moment of what is going on. I felt just really disconnected, kind of embarrassed too. And it started with this, me on this journey where I started reading books, watching films, kind of digging in a little bit deeper. Uh, the next restaurant I was opening was in the Bahamas. And kind of the same thing happened. I went into the walk-in refrigerator, all of the lettuce looked really sad and depleted. 
And I was like, chef, what, we can't serve this. We have a 270 seat restaurant operating three meals. We cannot serve this. Can you help me find a local farm? And they ended up sending me to this indoor hydroponic cucumber farm, which at first looked all impressive and futuristic, but was kind of uh, grown with a lot of chemicals and there was a lot of plastic and a lot of, didn't quite feel right. I ended up going for a walk around the corner and I bumped into this guy named Sakane, who's in the film. And he said, hey man, come check out this farm. And it turns out that he and this family he was working with were working on restoring and regenerating this one and a half acre organic farm next to the airport. Literally planes are flying in over us. And I spent three hours with him. And Sakane explained to me a couple things. First, that he, his dad was a farmer. And he said that he, the weather patterns are so different today than what he grew up with that he can't predict what to plant. We looked into the distance and we saw these like insane trash fires. I said, Sakani, what's that? And he said, there used to be 12,000 farms in the Bahamas, now there are 1,200. Everything gets shipped in on styrofoam wrapped in plastic and they send it to the landfill and they burn it. And he also said that he was one of the first people in his family to kind of go off, he didn't say vegan, but he said more plant-based and to kind of go off the processed food. And he was the only one to not develop a chronic disease. So he was explaining all of these things to me, this guy directly on the front line, you know, you could say he might be a little bit jaded by all these challenges he's facing, but he had this warmth and passion. <laughs> he had this as if to serve as an exclamation to my point. Thank you very much. <laughs> he had a joy and a passion and a love for food and farming and soil that I found so deeply inspiring. He was the first person to explain to me how deeply interconnected all of these things were. Um, and I called Simon. I said, Simon, this, this guy is amazing. I just spent like three, four hours with this guy. I was supposed to go back to the restaurant. He's amazing, you know, hanging out with him and his old friends. And Simon, in his wisdom, said, tell him we're going to come film an interview with him. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. What do you mean? And he's like, we'll figure it out. I was like, all right. I said, Sakani, I'm going to come back in three months and film an interview with you about the future of food. No idea what I was doing, not even close. And he was like, yeah, man, that's cool, whatever, you can come back. And he thought I was probably just totally full of it, which I wasn't, turns out. Um, came back three months later, and we filmed our first interview with Sakane. And after that interview, it was Sakane and then the other woman, Salima, and her family. And Simon and I were like, more people need to meet farmers. If people like us who grew up in the restaurant business, studied hospitality, were in it for our whole lives, just met a farmer at 27, Three hours changed my whole worldview. What happens if more people were inspired to meet farmers? I wanted to talk about the process from turning from an industrial farmer to a regenerative farm because I think farmers probably starting to really realize the benefits both financially for themselves, environmentally, knowing that the land can absorb CO2 and also for the health of themselves and for the people who are eating the food that they're producing. So can you talk us through the process of and how the length of time from when they decide that they want to make that shift and what that story kind of looks like. It's a very challenging process for farms to change operations. And I give incredible credit to those farmers who have done so. Why is it so difficult? Farming is a high cost, low margin business. You, you operate with the vagaries of weather and not knowing what's going to happen at any given moment. And you naturally have to be uh, somewhat adverse to risk in any change in operations because um, you could be out of business very quickly. But it's more than that because if you're a farmer, your business is also how you define yourself. It's possibly been in your family for many generations, and you don't want to be the one who loses the farm. So it's, it's tied up in issues of, of finance, of how you define yourself as a person, and all of those incredibly complicated and sometimes conflicting emotions of being part of a family and how you interact with yourself, your children, your parents, and the like. Very complicated stuff. Um, as a result, even though organizations like American Farmland Trust have been pushing 
different practice adoption for now over 40 years. The rate of adoption is actually fairly low. I'll take one regenerative practice, which is the notion of cover crops on, on, on good cropland, planting a, a second crop to keep the soil covered and to build organic matter. At present, probably only about 6% of the cropland in America that could be um, uh, covered with cover crops are, is done so. Um, that really hurts, particularly for an organization that's been pushing that for so long. And, but it's, it, it's because of those reasons, it's very hard to change. You add on top of that the fact that the average age of farmers in the United States is about 60 years old. Um, a 60 year old thinks they're about to retire. The truth is most farmers keep farming until they're 80, but from age 55 on, they think they're gonna retire soon and this change can be left to the next generation. So there's another level of complexity. Having said all of that, farmers are changing and it's tremendous to see it and it's happening faster and faster all the time. Why are they doing it? Um, they're doing it because they are seeing the impacts um, themselves of a changing climate on their operation and they're worried for the future. People frequently talk about, well, all those folks from middle America, they don't, they're climate denier. I have never met a farmer who is a climate denier. I've met many farmers who are very worried about what the government might ask them to do because of climate change. They may be very conservative and worried about that, but they see what's happening and they are more open to change than they ever were before. Now you asked about rates of change and all of that. Uh, cover crops is one example and there's the United States Department of Agriculture recognizes about 50 different practices that would improve soil health cover crops is only one. But cover crops, you do not see any benefit as a farmer until probably three years of applying cover crops. And you don't really see benefit to five or six years. And you have additional costs all of those early years until you get to the point of seeing those benefits. So that's one of the reasons why government policy really is important here. Because to move in that direction is a service to society and the planet. But farmers already on tight margins can in no way afford to take those steps without support. So um, I'll stop there because I don't want to keep talking. Obviously, this is my this is my life. This is my passion. I can talk, I can talk about it all all night. Um, but we can talk later if you want and talk about some other practices and how long they take. But the point is, the summary is that change is harder than you would think because of farming is more than a business and that uh, costs are an issue. Um, but uh, one, one last point, we have uh, 25 scientists on our staff, most of them are agronomists or people who understand soil health. A few years ago, when we were needing to replace our research director, because she was 70 years old, I told her she couldn't retire until she was 80, but she thought she was still nonetheless wanted to get out of that work. Um, and she's still there, but she's not a research director, I've kept her. Um, <laughs> But we were looking to replace her, and we, we thought very seriously that what we really needed to replace our top scientist with was a behavioral scientist, not another agronomist. Because really what we're talking about here is behavioral change. <laughs>